Good morning, my name is Doris Meissner. Those of you who have been regulars at this conference will know uh, what I'll say now to those who are new to this conference, and that is that for many years, the first panel of this uh, gathering has, but we, it has been what we call the state of play. And uh, in the state of play, we try to talk about what's current, what is the state of the immigration enterprise, the state of immigration uh, uh, politics, events, and uh, developments. And, um, uh, uh, and every year, it gets a little bit more interesting and a little bit more uh, charged. And I guess we've certainly met that standard this year, haven't we? <laughs> So um, uh, we have a terrific panel here of uh, 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 people that know politics on both sides of the aisle as well as people that cover these issues. And so let me quickly run through the speakers and then we're going to uh, uh, have as much of a conversation as we can. I'm gonna ask questions, uh, panelists will answer and we'll leave time at the end, uh, uh, obviously for audience participation. Um, on my left is Casey Higgins, who's the former assistant to the Speaker for Policy and Trade Council uh, when Paul Ryan was the speaker of the um, House of Representatives. She's now with Aiken Gump. Uh, 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 next to her is Lorella Praley, who's the President of Community Change Action and Vice President of Community Change, and this is a new job for Lorella, so we're welcoming her to her new post, and it's the organization that you might have known in the past as the Center for Community Change, which is going through a name rebranding. So welcome, Lorella. Delighted to have you here and delighted to have you in this new role. Um, uh, next comes Lomi Creel, who is immigration correspondent at the uh, Houston Chronicle and who has been very much on the front lines of these issues in her reporting. And then there's, of course, somebody that we all know and have such high regard for, Julia Preston. Uh, Julia Julia, of course, Julia is now a contributing writer at the Marshall Project, but most of you will know her as the long-standing immigration person reporting <coughs> for the New York Times. Julia, I think you and I are the gray hairs here at the table because <laughs> we have been at this for such a very, very long time. Um, and, um, and, and that's exactly why we wanted Julia to participate today. She's been a faithful part, uh, audience member uh, at these meetings, so she knows this drill very well but she really has a perspective that very few others can bring to the questions that are so pressing today. So um, let, me, um, uh, let me just make this opening observation, and that is that um, um, I'm going to ask sort of two sets of questions, questions that have to do with the border and questions that have to do with the politics of immigration as we go into a presidential election year. Uh, the issues that have to do with the border obviously are self-evident. Um, there is so much that has taken place since we met last year. Just thinking back mm -hmm. when we met last year at this conference, the caravans hadn't even begun. And um, suddenly came the caravans and then came all of the visibility that surrounded them, the increases in the numbers to very, very high levels, uh, peaking in May, uh, and uh, with it, uh, the dismantling, basically, of the country's asylum system. So there is so much to talk about that has to do with the border. We, of course, won't be able to cover all of it, but it's <coughs> top of the top of the uh, of the state of play idea. Um, and then, of course, where the election is concerned, we know that uh, President Trump believes deeply that he won his presidency largely on issues of immigration. We have every reason to believe that immigration will continue and recur as a center stage issue in a re-election in 2020. So that's, of course, extremely important as well. I'm going to begin the, uh, uh, the questions with our journalists. And I'm going to start first with Julia for the reasons that I talked about. And um, say that, you know, Julia, you have covered this issue and you've followed it for decades. And uh, uh, so you really do have some perspective on how things have evolved. I wonder whether you could start us off with some observations about the degree to which the current era is different 
from what you've seen in the past, or maybe it's not different. Maybe it really is what we know, which is that immigration has been contentious uh, throughout our history, and maybe this is simply today's version of it. But um, uh, talk to us about that, and if there's any observation that you have from what it is that we've just seen that just happened, feel free to share that as well. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, thank you so much, Doris and Andrew, and for organizing this important event every year, such a fantastic gathering of people who care about the immigration system. So thank you very much. Uh, so I see some continuities between President Trump and past administrations, but mostly very stark differences. But let's talk about some of the similarities. Uh, so border enforcement. Uh, I think that the President's uh, rhetoric about a porous border and building the big beautiful wall obscures the fact that border enforcement has been strengthened and fortified with, person, with border agents, surveillance technology, military style equipment, um, more enforcement since basically the 1990s and particularly under the end of the Bush administration and President Obama. So, uh, there is a lot of continuity, despite the rhetoric about the porous border, there's a lot of continuity uh, in terms of border enforcement. Uh, in terms of interior enforcement, um, I think it's always good to remember that by the Department of Homeland Security's own statistics, President Obama deported almost three million people. So the history of permanent punitive family separation in the form of deportation is not new with this administration. There's a legacy there from President Obama that I think is possible to forget about in the current environment. Uh, I think under President Bush, President Obama, and now Congress has failed spectacularly to take on its responsibilities to, to address the just extremely damaging, increasingly damaging dysfunction in our immigration system. The immigration system is failing, in my view, to meet the labor needs of the country, to live up to the United States humanitarian <coughs> and uh, uh, responsibilities and obligations, failing to achieve the social imperative of uniting uh, and preserving and strengthening immigrant families, and Congress has just been a wall on this issue through several administrations. I think it's good to remember that. And also, I think in the absence of congressional actions, uh, maybe something that's interesting for you, both President Obama and now President Trump in a very aggressive way have been tempted to use executive power to tinker with the immigration system in, in the interest of creating more deportations. And, uh, and Generally, this kind of executive tinkering, if that's the right word, has led to uh, a cascade of unintended consequences and um, more chaos in the system. So the, 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 the example I would point to, there are many examples of this, but the example I would point to is the effort to uh, uh, speed up uh, uh, you know, proceedings for certain people in the immigration courts. It started with the rocket docket under President Obama, and there's a certain law of gravity or of, of physics in the immigration courts, which is that when you speed up one case, you have to postpone another. This seems to be a, a basic equation that seems to escape the notice of the executives who want to somehow gin up these courts to get deportations done faster. And really all it's done is create increasing chaos, increasing backlogs, and a situation today where we have more than a million cases in the backlog of the immigration courts. I mean, really a catastrophe in the immigration courts. That said, am I saying that President Trump is, con is, is there's continuity or that this is somehow more of the same? I am not saying that. Uh, this, is a, this is a radical change, and mainly because this president is trying to change the core narrative that has animated our immigration policy for almost a century. And he sees immigration as a liability, not a benefit. I think at minimum, we can say that he regards immigrants and refugees with suspicion. You could 
take it further than that, but I think at minimum we can say that. And this is a kind of unabashed nativism, mm -hmm. empowered by the full authority of the White House that really we haven't, I, 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 go, I try to go back in history and try to remember when we've had this particular set of principles governing our immigration policy. And I want to just look at um, a detail that emerged from uh, this extraordinary story that my colleagues Mike Shear and Julie Davis had last week. Uh, a detail in this story that uh, drew less attention than the moat filled with snakes and alligators that the president had proposed. But it was that uh, uh, Steve Miller, who was the uh, president's policy advisor, uh, uh, was seeking to replace uh, Francis Cisna, Frank Cisna, as the head of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. And those of us, you know, in this room familiar with Frank's record would not necessarily describe him as a softy. But the, but Miller's idea was that he wanted, he, he didn't think that Cisna was doing enough to, to, as he put it, change the culture at United States Citizenship and Immigration Service. And now this is the agency that delivers, that delivers approvals of visas. This is the agency that when a person qualifies is supposed to put out the welcome mat. And instead what this administration is seeking to do is turn this agency into the agency that rejects people, that keeps people out. So you can't imagine a more profound cultural change, philosophical change in the system. And I just want to cite one example of that. There are many of them, but it's one that, that Doris referred to, which is the onslaught, the systematic dismantling by this administration of our asylum system with respect to the southwest border. So I just want to mention briefly what's happened there, and I'm probably leaving a few things out, but uh, former Attorney General Sessions and the current Attorney General, William Barr, have used their authorities uh, over the immigration courts to, to revise decades of case law and shut down the availability of asylum to specifically to the people who are coming from Central America uh, with claims having to do with gang violence and sexual predation. Uh, the administration has sharply limited the discretion and fle flexibility of judges in the immigration courts who are dealing with these asylum systems to give prosecutorial discretion or to exercise flexibility with the way they're handling their dockets and the way they're handling these cases. The administration has moved to deny bond to asylum seekers and uh, increase the detention of asylum seekers. The administration applied zero tolerance criminal prosecutions for unauthorized border crossings, even if to people who were intending, had expressed an intention to seek asylum. The administration has attempted to force migrants to request asylum only at ports of entry at the same time that they were, as they call it, metering people who came to the ports of entry, so they were restricting the access of people to come to the ports of entry and ask for asylum. So they, you know, I'm, I'm uh, some of these things have been subject to legal challenges, but this is, I'm just giving you, a, trying to give you a picture of all the things that have happened here. Uh, the administration, as we all know, has returned now some 50,000 asylum seekers to Mexico with no support, no, virtually no provision to provide counsel, um, uh, 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 no, no, you know, not even a basic notification system to await their hearings after they've been served notices to appear. <laughs> And the administration imposed, attempted to uh, 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 put through a rule for indefinite detention of, of women and families and children seeking asylum. And now to cap it off, we have a unilateral, what's essentially a unilateral declaration making Mexico a third safe country, even though uh, Mexico has consistently refused to uh, sign an agreement to do that. And this is, basically uh, a provision that, that by, as far as I can tell, is just going to shut the system down completely to people coming from Central America. So, you know, these things have faced core challenges, but this just gives you uh, uh, a, uh, uh, an idea, just if we're looking at the asylum system, this, this consistent, relentless focus on shutting down the opportunities in the immigration system. So 
Is this different? Yes, this is different. Okay, Lomi, um, you're on the ground on this. We stand back and do analysis and look at the, you know, read the reports, et cetera, et cetera, but you're living it and breathing it and you're reporting all the time. And so I'd like you to talk about what it actually feels like down there. What do you see happening um, uh, uh, with the, the flows and the circumstances at the border now in your reporting? Um, uh, could this flow and what has been taking place with Central Americans, could it have been anticipated? How could the government have been so unprepared to deal with a sharp rise in the numbers? Um, and um, uh, the classic question now that's arisen, is this a manufactured crisis or is this, has this been a crisis? Well, the reality is on the ground kind of um building off what Julia said, has really changed so drastically since May, um, mainly because of two of the Trump administration's most significant policies that have um, taken, that have unfolded since then that are really keeping all migrants from entering the southern border. Um, and there are two, also the two policies that have really received the least public attention, um, even though journalists and advocates have done an ex um, exceptional work covering them. The one is the migrant protection protocols, which returns um, migrants to Mexico to wait there for the duration of their court dates. And as Julia mentioned, the policy of metering, which limits how many can cross at ports of entry, in many cases now only two or three, and sometimes none a day. Um, so these policies have had the most dramatic impact but has not fueled nearly, nearly the same type of widespread outrage that we saw with family separation last summer. And I think a lot of this is because it's playing out out of sight, out of mind. But the consequences have really been horrific. I was in Juarez when uh, MPP just expanded, and I was in a, a shelter, a church shelter, when some of the first asylum seekers were returned. And this was at the peak of what um, Acting Secretary called the the breaking point um, in El Paso. And so many of the families I spoke to in that church had spent 10 days in a board patrol processing facility. They were sleeping, s sitting up, had not been able to shower or even brush their teeth. And when they were sent back to Mexico, not only did they not have anywhere to go, but they were also really, really sick. And we're talking about little children, you know, women in their 60s and 70s. Um, even at that early point, so this was in May, and now, of course, it's, the program has dramatically expanded even more across the border. But even at that point, the city of Juarez was already overwhelmed. The mayor back then said he, they, couldn't take any, they couldn't house any more migrants, they didn't have any more space, and that he was concerned that it would aggravate not only xenophobic sentiments among Mexicans, but um, more violence by cartels who see the migrants as vulnerable and quick cash opportunities. So since then, it's only gone much worse as they've now expanded the program to uh, Nuevo Laredo and Matamoros, which are far dangerous border cities. And what we're seeing now is migrants camped out in informal tent settlements by the bridge because they don't feel safe going into the city or there simply isn't more space in the shelters there. And so the health conditions there are really bad. It's also really dangerous as uh, cartel members and organized crime know that they're all in one place. Um, there have been more than 340 reports of rape, kidnapping, torture, or other violence against migrants who've been returned, which is certainly an undercount. Um, many have been bused elsewhere to Mexico and then uh, re returned willingly to places where they may be in real danger because they don't know how much longer they can wait in Mexico. And of course, as Julia also mentioned, there's almost no access to, to legal counsel, even though now with the new ban on asylum, their chances of getting that protection is, is even more slim. So the impact of those two policies alone is really cannot be overstated. Um, to your second question of whether this could have been anticipated, I mean, that it certainly could have. The increase in families from Central America coming here has been happening since 2014. Um, and so, you know, it's been, it's been happening for a combination of push and pull factors that we've all been talking about, writing about, warning about since then, including violence, poverty, and 
an immigration system that allows migrants to stay here for years while they wait for their court cases. Uh, the department, but there have been a couple of politic plays on this as well. In October 2018, the Department of Homeland Security warned it was a crisis, but the calls went largely ignored. Um, Democrats accused the president of exaggerating the situation. Um, he was calling it an invasion at the border. And at the time, the numbers were certainly not as overwhelming as they would be a few months later. Um, and many rightfully criticized the administration's own policies for exaggerating the crisis, combined with smugglers who were taking advantage of the situation and the kind of erratic U.S. policy. After the administration ended its family separation policy, word quickly spread that the time to come to the U.S. was now before the president shut the border. But the administration also did some things that seemed to exaggerate or, or worse, it certainly didn't help the numbers coming here. They, last fall, they began releasing migrant families en masse in border cities rather than coordinating their releases with nonprofits as they had before, which lent to this idea that there was a run at the border. Um, they also, of course, diverted billions of dollars to a wall, which does nothing to stop migrant families from coming here. And instead, in many places at the border, they wait right by the wall for Border Patrol agents to pick them up. So that money could have been better spent to go to immigration judges and asylum officers to expedite um, cases. Uh, like Julia mentioned, some of their own policies within the courts also further clogged the system, including by, for example, ending a tool known as administrative closure, in which they could have just taken some cases off the docket if judges found the mi migrants may have a good reason to stay. But is it all a manufactured crisis? No. Uh, the, I mean, that president certainly used the idea of an invasion for political purposes. But by the spring, it was clear that the federal government was overwhelmed by the number of families. And the consequences, in some cases, were deadly because the system was just not set up for it. At least seven children, we know, have died in immigration custody. And I think that the key thing here is that though Democrats have argued illegal immigration is far less than a peak of one million in 2001, the, democratic, the demographics are so different now from mostly single Mexican men that came before to mostly Central American families, often with very small children who are much more difficult to, um, to detain safely and quickly deport. And so the two flows are really not comparable. Okay, um, <clears throat> we're going to go now um, to people that know what's going on in the politics of this and, and have been on different sides of trying to deal with these issues constructively. And on the same uh, side sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Um, and I want to ask you first, Lorella, uh, because you've been, you know, your career has been both in the world of immigration advocacy as well as in immigration politics, and you've worked in... Uh, uh, Sen uh, Secretary Clinton's campaign, etc. So you you know you see this from a number of different places, and and where advocacy and and uh, uh, political parties are concerned, they don't always align. Mm -hmm. um, and on this particular issue that Lomi's just been talking about, this question of whether the circumstances at the border were a manufactured crisis or not, I mean, Democrats basically called it a manufactured crisis, and they didn't respond in the Congress uh, uh, when the administration first uh, really began to ra ring the alarm bells, as, as Lomi pointed out. Um, you know, looking back and reflecting on wh where that's taken us and these policies that are in place, did, did, did Dems make the right call on this? Why did it take them so long to be willing to move on basic humanitarian assistance, whatever the reasons were mm -hmm. for how it came about when people were truly suffering? Um, and, um, um, you know, can you imagine what, what, what would have satisfied Democrats at that time when you have those kinds of numbers? Thank you, Doris. Um, I will start by saying I don't work for the Democratic Party, um, so I am just sharing my views as an advocate. And I'm not sure I would actually agree with the, f the way that you framed the question um, and would almost ask us to move back a little bit. I want to credit you um, for just all of the unveiling that you did, really covering family separations in El Paso when people weren't really paying attention. Um, and I think it started as a manufactured crisis precisely because 
we've got to go back and look at the zero tolerance policy, right? This was of the administration's own doing, and I think the goal was chaos. The goal was unintended consequences. They weren't unintended. I actually believe that the administration, or at least a camp in the administration, felt very strongly that what they needed to create at the border was this sense of chaos and influx, large numbers, uh, inability to move resources. And so the, the, the question is resources for what, right? I think that we sort of, we have to start asking ourselves first that question. Is it resources to increase their capacity to detain more people as they have been doing? Is it resources to care for people? And so I think we've got to interrogate our assumptions and our questions first. Um, I want to quote one of my colleagues at NIJC, Heidi Altman, who always says, they're constantly crying poverty when we're talking about baby diapers. Um, but if they have, if there's a need for an extra 400 bed contract, they always find a way to find the money. Right? And so I think in, in every uh, conversation, <laughs> when we engage about the need for resources and what Republicans are pushing for, first I think we have to understand that as a given, as part of their goal. And then I think we have to move into a conversation about what is the purpose of creating chaos at the border. And this administration hasn't been shy about the fact that what they want are, is for Congress to intervene, not just to appropriate more resources, for them to apprehend and detain and remove people, but because they want to change our asylum system. So they want to create a political problem for Democrats and Republicans and for advocates so that the laws are changed in their favor, right? So that the laws mirror their vision for how we should be treating refugees and asylees in our country. And so I think that's, that's where it starts. Um, and I think that there is, just to now to move into more of the Democratic Party politics, um, I think that there is an active conversation um, within the caucus about how do you put forward a different vision. I think there are people comfortable with the way that things were under the Obama administration. I think that then there's a cohort um, that is moving in the direction, frankly, when I think about politics and what makes the impossible possible, right? We, we, we get really caught up in our own politics as immigration advocates and in our movement. But if you sort of move back a little bit and think about the base, and who is going to turn out in primaries, and then who's going to turn out in the general election, you know, we've got to think about what else is happening in the progressive space and in, on the issues in general. And I think that what you're seeing today with some candidates moving down in the Democratic Party and those who are really holding the number one, two, three in slots is that the American public is urging for transformative structural change. <laughs> And the only reason we're not having that conversation here when it comes to immigration, I believe, is because we are afraid. We're not leaning into the conversation in the way that other people are leaning into their issues. We're sort of trying to figure out, do we get back to Obama era reforms? Or what are the th how do we approach this so we don't lose the election? No other issue is really having that conversation. They are saying what Trump has done is shedding light on laws and injustices in the system that have been in place for many decades. What does it take to actually move in a fundamentally different direction when we think about what our immigration system needs to look like? Right? And that's a very different conversation that I think this movement, our movement, is not really engaging in. Right? You think of an Elizabeth Warren, for example. And she's sort of rolling out massive, you know, restructuring plans. And I think she falls a little short on immigration still, right? And so I would just, put, I would just offer that up as it's important to think about what's happening on our issue right now. And it's also important to look at the broader movement ecosystem and then ask ourselves if we're, if we're showing up in this moment as the election heats up, you know, with the right approach in mind. Let's hold that thought and come back to it um, when we talk a bit more about politics, because that's, uh, I, 
I'd like to hear you say some more things about that, and some of the other panelists may want to mm -hmm. comment on, on, on that as well. But to finish the first round, um, I'm going to turn to Casey now, who is very familiar with Republican politics and with frustrations on the other side <laughs> of working on these issues as a practical matter uh, on the Hill. Uh, and uh, ask you, Casey, that, I mean, as you well know, Republicans have been such strong uh, advocates for strengthened enforcement, for border security, for uh, what came to be known in the you know, earlier years as enforcement first before any other kind of investment spendings, et cetera. Um, and, um, um, and so, you know, as Julia pointed out in her opening comments, I mean, enforcement has really uh, uh, come to, you know, into full, into full force with resources and techniques, et cetera. Uh, do you see Republicans being satisfied at this point? with the enforcement stance uh, that is taking place at the southwest border? Are Republicans in a place where they believe that what Trump is doing is finally realizing the kind of policy outlook that has been so you know, uh, 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 fully pressed in the Republican Party? And, um, um, and do you see any movement among Republicans, particularly in the Senate, to deal with this issue that the administration <clears throat> advances all the time, which is that the reason that the system at the border is having a problem is because of loopholes in the law, and that those loopholes have to be fixed. And that, as Julia says, Congress needs to do something. So talk about how Republicans see this to the degree that you understand mm -hmm. it. Yeah, it's interesting to me. I think we've come from a very different place now than we were in 13 and 14. And when we made a run at this in 2013, 2014, after the Senate passed S744 on a bipartisan basis, um, and at that point, you know, it was very much throw money at the problem. And, and that worked in the Senate. And I think what we tried to do at that point in the House was actually be able to respond to that legislation. And we got a lot closer than people realized we did, I think. And ultimately, we weren't able to pass a product because of political dynamics that were kind of outside our control. But we were right at the cusp of going to the floor with a huge package of bills that would have spanned the spectrum. Um, and I think would have been a good offering from the House, controlled by Republicans, that we could have worked with the Senate to try to find that middle ground. And I think there was an opportunity there. Um, it took us a long time, and we didn't quite make it. Um, but the interesting thing from doing this in 13, 14, in, in doing this over the past couple of years has been there are these two sort of perspectives in the Republican Party on immigration. And, you know, from my, my former boss's perspective, from my perspective, from a lot of members' perspective, they come at this through a free market lens. And they look at this and they say, you know, mm. immigration is part of, of building this uh, economic capacity and there are different pieces of it and we should have robust immigration systems. We should have border security, we should enforce the law, but immigration is a good thing. And then you have this other section of the party that doesn't look at it that way. And I think for the first time, and, and different from when uh, President Bush worked on this in 2006 and we gave it a run at legislation, We've, we now have the rise among the party that doesn't look at it through that free market lens. Um, doesn't necessarily see robust immigration as being helpful to the economy, but thinks it hurts Americans' wages or whatever the case may be. So I think with the rise of that section of the party, it's kind of changed the, the dialogue. And certainly President Trump has changed the dialogue in a way that um, you know Republicans hadn't necessarily been voicing these issues previously. And I think part of the issue, and I, and I love Laura's comment about trying to figure out what those policy ideas need to be to move forward here, because the issue that I've always seen is a lack of education. Um, so ultimately, I think Republicans believe that they never got the border security that they were promised in 1986. And they know we need to modernize the border. They want to restore order generally. Um, there's frustration when they feel like there is a crisis on the border and there's denial of that. Um, they want to figure out how you come together and, and move forward in passing actual legislation instead of just the executive acting, but among the public and frankly among 
a lot, a lot of people in Washington, they don't understand immigration. And when my boss would go to a town hall, it would actually take him seven to eight minutes to talk about border security, to talk about guest worker programs, to talk about the Dreamers, to talk about broader legalization and help his constituents understand why he had the approach that he did. And that's a, it's a long time, but he could do it because he really took time to dig in and understand the issues. Uh, immigration is complicated, and it takes a lot for members to figure that out. And I think where you know we've had a lot of focus on healthcare and other issues, and they've taken the time to learn those. I think across the board, there's just you know among the public and among members, they don't fully grasp it. I'm from Wisconsin, and until I went down to the border, you don't really understand it. I didn't grow up with it. I don't live in Houston, you know. You and I've been down to the border several times, and every time I'm down there, I learn something new and I get a new perspective on it. And so I think that education can help everyone across the board try to figure out how we move forward um, on border security, but also on other issues as well. And I also want to say, I think one of the things that gets lost is that fixing the legal immigration system will help the border, right? It will le relieve pressure on the border. Um, High walls, wide gates, don't mean walls in the sense that, that the president uses it. But the, you know, the, the idea is that if you've got your economic immigrants coming through the front door, you can focus on drug traffickers and other issues at the border. Um, so I think from a free market perspective, that's how those of us look at legal immigration can actually help along the border. Um, but we need to have bipartisan conversations. And in 13 and 14, we were um, having really amazing bipartisan conversations. And at that this point, I think, both sides have retreated so far to their corners um, that we've got to really work to find out how we get back to that middle point. We haven't had a um, full comprehensive proposal uh, that was bipartisan since, since S744 in 2013. And it's, it's been a long time since then. The world has changed a lot since then. Um, so we need to start having those bipartisan conversations again, figure out how we can actually get to the root of some of these problems um, to address the border, but also to address the dreamers and address the broader population, fix the legal immigration system so it works. Um, there's a lot we can and, and need to do, but I think both sides need to figure out how we can come back to the middle, use our common sense, approach these issues in a way that we can actually get something done. Because when you keep having the pendulum swing back and forth in the White House and, you know, you have... President Obama, who came in and did DACA and all these things for, through executive action. And then the pendulum swings, and you've got Trump doing all these things through executive action. We need Congress to act. And at the end of the day, it's got to be bipartisan. Republicans tried to do something, uh, several things, last year in the House and the Senate without the cooperation of Democrats, and it wasn't successful. Um, you know, Democrats have moved some legislation this year, but I think ultimately until the two sides decide that they can come together and try to figure out a bipartisan compromise, you're not going to see legislation and you're not going to be able to truly address these issues. We can, we can throw money at certain problems um, through appropriations bills, but that's not fixing the ultimate problem at the end of the day. Well, <clears throat> that, Doris, can, yeah. can I just ask, because um, I know we're going to do another round of questions, but I just want to, there was one thing that you didn't say that I would love to hear your thoughts on, which is the role of race, mm -hmm. right? And so, so how does that factor into your analysis about where the Republican Party, like first it's just the big question, you know, like what is the, how does the role of, how do you see race as part of your analysis in the Republican Party at this time and how they're responding to what is happening. And then my other question is, can the Republican Party survive and continue to be relevant once it solved this problem or this issue, mm -hmm. right? Like, so I have gotten, my, my analysis on this, and I may be totally off, is that over the years, you've seen less Republicans willing to engage. Like, there's no political gain from their perspective to engage in this issue. There's a political gain to engage in the opposite direction. Right? You keep the issue alive. It is Trump's mobilizing issue. It's what he ran on in 16 and 15, 16. It's what he's going to run on again, and he's doing that now. And so I think if you could weigh in on how do you see race as a factor, as a dynamic in the caucus today, in the party? And then the other is, can the party continue to build power without or once it solves this issue? Yeah, I don't, uh, you know, there are always outliers. I don't think race is a factor. I just don't. They're, you're getting, 
you're going to have outliers in the party. Um, but I think for the majority of the party, they don't look at it through that lens. So yes, you're going to have. But you don't have the majority. You didn't have the majority in 13 or 14 to address the issue. For what reason? I don't think it's a policy disagreement. Yeah, I mean, it's I interesting. So we actually did. Um, and I was a part of the whip team that got to the majority that we needed to be able to move forward. And like I said, they're frankly, Eric Andrew lost right. the primary. It got blamed on immigration. That's all and you have to know. We could not move forward at that point. But exactly. I mean, we, you know, I covered this debate in 2013 and 2014. We wrote dozens of stories at the New York Times. There was only one story we needed to write, which was the defeat of Eric Cantor by Dave Bratt in his primary. Mm -hmm. That was it. That yep. happened. No immigration reform. And it was ascribed to immigration, and it wasn't the the loss really wasn't even about immigration. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was you no, know, it, was it wasn't. About immigration. It wasn't. Yeah, Laura. So the whole thing is perception, that. as compared to. Correct. What, well, it goes you know, it, what, anyway. What to me, it, it goes back. It goes back to there is a Repu Republican. There's a stronghold in the Republican Party that is animated and that it, uh, that engage us with this issue through a race perspective. I mean, President Trump launched his campaign by calling Mexican, Mexicans rapists, right? Like, I mean, if that is not racist, is that, if that is not suggesting a particular ideology and way of looking at the world, then like, I just, I, I and I'm not saying it to, to be agitational, I'm saying it because I actually, I wanna fix this problem. Like, I wanna fix the issue. I think our current, our present is unsustainable. I think that the solutions of the past are not going to make it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're not enough. And so I, how do we actually get there, though, if we can't have a real conversation about the dynamics animating the conversation and the politics? But I well, think it's I, hard to say you can't have a conversation if you're also saying all Republicans are racist. I and didn't that's, say all. No, no, I know, no, no, I I know you didn't. You did not. Right? And that's, but that's my point, too, is, and it's the first thing I said, was we have these two sections of the Republican Party that look at things from a different perspective. There is and has been in the past a majority of Republicans that want to work together. They don't view this from a racial perspective. They want to work to fix this problem. And we need to find the members in both of those parties if we ever expect to be able to move forward. It can't be, well, you're a Republican. You must agree with everything Donald Trump says, and we cannot have a conversation about this until Donald Trump is gone. It's just unacceptable to, and I'm not saying yeah. you said that, I'm just saying it's unacceptable for us to say, as long as Trump is president, as long as these things are happening, we can't have a conversation. Both sides need to figure out how to come together, and I think both sides use the politics of it to their advantage. I think for Democrats, it's been not necessarily in their interest to, to get together with Republicans and fix the problem because they can use the fact that it hasn't been fixed to keep hammering Republicans. So I think both sides are at fault. I think there's a place in the middle where there are good people that want to find genuine solutions mm -hmm. to address these problems. Don't come at it from a race perspective. You know, want border security, but want to fix the asylum system, want to treat people in a humane, humane way, want to fix the legal immigration system, and frankly, want to find a solution for all of the undocumented population. I've seen those members, I've talked to them, they exist. It's, it's just it's tough political dynamics right now on both sides. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that uh, the point that you made earlier, Casey, about, how, ab about education and about people being incredibly uninformed, uh, including legislators mm -hmm. and many legislators, about uh, the complexity of the immigration story and what it really uh, uh, means and, and, and why it is that we have the issues we have. I mean, for instance, with Central Americans, there's no other way to get here at this point than the asylum system. The asylum system was not set up for these kinds of numbers. There are lots of people in that flow that could, if there were a work visa system of some kind, um, uh, you know, qualify, those kinds of questions. I agree. I, I mean, I think we would all agree. There's just a tremendous amount of ignorance about all those issues. But to some extent, the answer to that does reside in elections. I mean, ultimately, how do you change things in ways that creates what we would call, you know, some kind of a center um, that can, in fact, uh, 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 come together because we know that there has to be bipartisanship. Uh, in order for there really to be progress on immigration. And so <clears throat> I'm going to take us to elections mm -hmm. and the next election cycle, um, because from everything that we see right now, we're stuck. We're just paralyzed. 
and um, uh, legislatively. And the only thing that can really shake that up uh, is, is elections. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the, 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 the next round in 2020 and um, um, the degree to which immigration actually will or won't affect election outcomes. I mean, it's clearly an unsolved question. It's clearly something that both parties use in one way or another, but are not prepared to um, yet uh, uh, give up in terms of making compromises. Um, but that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that that they're going to be prepared to give it up, um, even though everybody knows this needs to be fixed. So, Lomi, talk to us about the border states in the first place, and particularly about Texas. Texas is one of those states that people are talking about possibly could turn purple. Um, were Texas to become purple, uh, were Texas to turn, uh, that would entirely change the electoral map. And so here you have these is this issue that is so pressing in along the border. How, um, how do you see immigration playing in the Texas political picture? other border states, and um, um, you know, to what degree do you see this ferment around immigration actually translating into election outcomes? Well, you know, Texas, even for being such a Republican state, has also uh, for years was really moderate actually on immigration under Governor Bush, um, under Governor Perry, was the first state to pass um, in-state tuition for undocumented immigrants. So it's really just in the past few election cycles that uh, the rhetoric um, has really become more intense, the anti-immigrant rhetoric. And we saw that um, particularly last year in the Senate race with Ted Cruz and Beto O'Rourke, where um, Cruz, it was a very tight race with immigration being really part of it. In fact, just days before the election, Senator Cruz accused O'Rourke of funneling money to the caravan. And, um, you know, it played up. I was at his election party, and the first chant that, that went up after his very, very narrow victory was uh, 3%, the closest winning margin in, since 1990 in Texas. Uh, as soon as his victory was declared, the first chant that sort of began in the room was build that wall. So clearly that was very sort of part of um, what his base voters were excited about. But, you know, and though he ultimately won, um, what you saw happening kind of down ballot in Texas, which was really a blue sweep, and also where O'Rourke ended up winning, which is every urban area in the state, and including um, sort of ex-urban areas that Republicans had won in the past, um, many, including uh, Sandra Cruz's political advisor, found very indicative of what might come next year. Um, you know, we know that the share of Latinos and Asian Americans as Texas is becoming more diverse is, is increasing. And uh, many say they are galvanized by this, um, the current sort of anti-immigrant rhetoric. And we saw that particularly kind of play out in Fort Bend County, which used to belong to Tom DeLay. Um, it was a, a very Republican area, and um, now, you know, it's, um, it's still represented by a Republican, but who just announced he was going to not seek re-election, re and it's considered a district that will very likely go Democrat. And also sort of down-ballot races, um, voters elected an Indian immigrant as the, count the county's top executive which was uh, not only the first time they voted for a Democrat in three decades, but Indian Americans in that county, which make up a big uh, percentage, came out and voted Democrat in ways never seen before, and many of them are immigrants or the children of immigrants. And another thing that happened um, this year that I think will have a significant impact is the mass shooting in El Paso, mm -hmm. in which the shooter, the gunman, um, spouted anti-immigrant rhetoric and invoking many of the terms like invasion that the president has used and in fact so has uh, Governor Abbott and Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick has used similar terms which they've been criticized for. And many um, think it's having an impact. According to a Univision poll, almost 70 percent of Latinos in Texas say, said last month that race relations have deteriorated in the past two years 
and three quarters say their vote matters more in 2020 than in 2018. 69% um, they'll vote Democrat or are leaning to vote Democrat. So, you know, I think that that combined with just the increasing um, urbanization of the state, the increasing diversity of the state, will have an impact next year. Six Republican congressmen have said they're not seeking re-election. Three are in flippable districts. Republican Senator John Cornyn is going to face probably a tough re-election campaign, although likely will, um, will be victorious. And Democrats are also increasingly, there's a ch really good chance they might take big, back the state house, which would um, be a significant difference. So, you know, I think it is having an impact. Do you, do you know enough about, I mean, it, what about the other border states? Arizona is another state, obviously, that is very much in flux. Do you have a sense whether you would say similar things about a state like Arizona? I, mean, I think we saw that last year when, you know, there was an increase, and I'm sure Lorelei can talk more about it, a huge um, increase in the Latino voter mm -hmm. turnout. We also saw that, which happened, um, Texas passed its own sanctuary city bill, but after Arizona, which first did that, the Latino voter share dramatically uh, went up the year, the, the election cycle after that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would just chime in and say, you know, we can spend a lot of time taking the temperature or we can make the temperature. And, you know, when I think about power building and when I think about electoral politics and civic engagement work, I mean, it comes, it's, it, these things aren't going to happen just because there are more Latinos or more API potential voters. We've got to do a significant amount of infrastructure building in these states. It's very expensive operation to register people to then turn them out, actually to persuade them to vote, right? And then to turn them out. And I think where, where I think the Democratic Party has failed, for example, I'll let others chime in on the, on the Republican Party, is the, Republican, the Democratic Party sort of expects people to turn out, a lot, a lot of people of color, um, without, and because it's very, um, it's very dependent, it's very cycle dependent. Right? And so you have a presidential cycle, you go in, you're trying to win a primary, and it really isn't until the general election that you start to register voters in a serious way and then to turn out voters. And even then, Latinos and API voters are, uh, are impacted negatively because we don't, we are not, um, we don't, we are newer voters because we are younger and because we don't have a record of having come out to vote you know, in the last four cycles, mm -hmm. right? And so we're already not really on the target list or the, or the universe for Democrats to knock on our doors or for a lot of the entities that are set up to knock on our doors, which is why we need more organizations and we need more money going to organizations on the ground in Texas and across all of these states that are important and frankly across the country right, to do and engage in that hard work of identifying potential voters, of then registering to them to vote, doing voter education, and then doing turnout. And so I think that's, it's so important to go back to the basics and the fundamentals, because we get caught up in this conversation about the politics of the issue, you know, whether or not people turn out, but we've actually got to pay attention to what does it take to win? What does it take to build power? What does it take to be a force at the ballot box? Um, and I think that what I saw in the, in the Trump administration and what we've seen with interference from other countries in our own elections here is that the goal is to decentivize our or demobilize our base, right? Demobilize voters of color, right? Tell them that the kind of policies and the leaders are not actually working on their behalf. Um, and to tap into anti-immigrant rhetoric to mobilize their base. And I think that's a dynamic that we saw in 2016. It's hopefully not a dynamic we'll see in this race because there will be people to work to make, working to make sure that folks turn out to vote. Julia, uh, uh, Lomi, did you wanna, yeah. go ahead. Well, Casey, I just actually wanted to, to uh, follow up with, you know, you were saying earlier that um, more people need to be coming to the table now and having this discussion, but yet, like in Texas, we're seeing Republicans who know the issue very well, like Will Hurd, leaving the conversation mm -hmm. rather than joining. Um, and we see kind of this real polarized within Texas Republicans between kind of the, the moderate, the ones who know immigration mm -hmm. very well and the others playing more towards their sort of suburban base. So 
how do republic i mean one is literally leaving who can add a lot yeah. to that conversation how do you mm -hmm. bring it back yeah no it's a good question i think the interesting thing to, and i'm no expert in republican politics by any means from a campaign perspective but i think you know, the rhetoric is not helpful. And, you know, you look back at George Bush, who actually took a huge portion of the Latino vote, right, and it was very open about wanting to do immigration reform. He was pro-border security, um, but wanted to do immigration reform and really tackle the whole problem. I think the rhetoric has obviously hurt Republicans from that perspective, but it's interesting because the base still wants border security. Most people, I think, still want border security. I think it's not necessarily the rhetoric that they are receptive to it's more that they feel like i said they feel like 1986 it didn't happen so we need border security i think republicans need to figure out how to better articulate the whole of their position on this um, because it can't just be about border security like right like i said fixing the legal immigration system is going to help overall and there are candidates who are looking at this trying to figure out okay yes we we do need to make some changes here and i think we can all agree modernizing the ports of entry things like that are are, are smart things to do so where's the common ground but let's articulate the the more holistic position that we have on that and i think that's the challenge that candidates are having um it but it is it's a tough time for republicans right right now will is is great he's a friend of mine He's been awesome to work with on this issue. I think he's been really helpful in the Republican Party, and we need to make sure that we're bringing in new candidates that can speak that way as well. Um, younger people that can bring some new life to the party. Um, because I think, you know, long term, this, this tough rhetoric um, that makes you all laugh at me when I say it's not race-based, um, it's, it's not gonna work. It's just not gonna make a difference long term and it's not gonna help the, the Republican Party survive. We need to be better about these things. Um, and I think that there are a lot of members that, that don't see it that way and we need to make sure we're continuing to build that piece of the party. Casey, let me follow up and ask you just on that point um, in terms of bringing new members in, changing the makeup of the party in ways that allow for uh, some kind of bipartisanship again, et cetera. I mean, it comes down to the Senate at this point. And um, um, what about the Senate? How do senators, I mean, the Senate map for the next election is mm -hmm. not terribly good. I mean, it's more difficult for mm -hmm. Republicans yeah. than it is for Democrats. But you've just heard Lomi say that probably Senator Cornyn, for instance, uh, will be reelected. I think that's... He'll have a harder fight, but I think most people would accept that. That's incredibly important. Um, do you do you see that there? Uh, how how do how how can Republicans navigate this mm -hmm. in a way that in an election there's a different outcome? Mm -hmm. Does what voters vote for? Does immigrate if immigration is an important issue in the election in terms of of defeating uh, even? Uh, uh, those that have, as you said, Will Heard, have leaving the Congress, et cetera. What changes the Senate in an election if that's critical now? Yeah, and it's interesting because I think, um, and you, you're seeing it in polling, it is certainly a very important issue among Republicans right now. Um, I go back to the education, you know, since we keep talking about Senator Cornyn, Senator Cornyn is fantastic on these issues. I mean, he knows them, he understands them, and he can also go into a town hall and talk about those issues uh, behind the scenes he's worked on this issue for years and he actually has been a, a force for good in trying to push for a compromise position so i think member like i said on the education front members like that that can really articulate their position um my former boss go into a town hall and he would talk about why he thinks we need to find a path to legalize the undocumented that are here. And that is a tough thing to talk about in Wisconsin. And he would take some arrows for that, but for the most part, because he was able to explain to people why he felt that way and really articulate his position, he was gonna be just fine. So, you know, it, everyone's walking a tightrope right now without question when it comes to this issue. But if you learn it, if you know it, if you speak articulately and, and help people learn about it, that's gonna help you at the end of the day. Julia, do you think that we're going to see a replay of 2016 in terms of President Trump um, uh, putting immigration front and center again? I do. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, uh, so, so. It's already started. Yeah. So let's talk about. We had the, we, he, he went to uh, California recently and talked about frying an egg on the wall. So he's, he, you know, he's, he's, uh, it, uh, it's going to be a little more complicated. Yeah, for that's, him the, this that's time. the question. Is it yeah, more complicated? In what ways? Why? Well, but another politician might be a little concerned about the fact that we're two and a half years in and not a single mile. Of new of what they call new border wall system has been built. I mean, they're they have plans to finish this, you know, some portion of this wall between now and 2020. But uh, another politician might have been concerned about the fact that the Congress, including the Republican-controlled Senate, has voted twice to cancel his border emergency and deny him the authority to raid the Pentagon budget, but this president is not a fact-based president, as we know. And, you know, this wall has been um, such a powerful symbol for him, and he's going to have plenty of photo opportunities in front of some big black structure down there that I'm sure he's going to be using that uh, as his campaign, you know, a centerpiece of his campaign. I would, I am, I would point out to you some, a, a, a political paradox about this, which is that I'm in touch with a lot of people in Mexico, and the joke in Mexico City right now is Mexico built the wall and Mexico is paying for it. Why? Well, I mean, there's no physical structure at the, at the southern border with Guatemala of Mexico, but Mexico has deployed a brand new National Guard Many more than the 6,000 National Guard troops that Mexico promised have been deployed across the southern border. They are deporting many more people. Uh, they are enforcing that border in a way that's never been enforced before, and Mexico is paying for that. Mexico is also, with no provision, no funding, virtually no logistical agreement, hosting, what, 50,000? 50,000 asylum seekers in Ciudad Juárez. I mean, Lomé talked about this. These are some of the most dangerous cities in Mexico. But President Andrés Manuel López Obrador, supposed to be a leftist national president, his philosophy has been, I don't want to fight with this guy in Washington. And so Mexico has allowed, Mexico, the country that the, the President Trump has routinely vilified, is now become the country whose cooperation has become fundamental for the Trump administration to succeed in with its border strategy. And I'm sure that President Trump is not going to mention Mexico when he takes credit for that on the campaign trail. But I would say that after El Paso, um, uh, after family separation, you know, I, I can't think that this rhetoric is going to have the same mobilizing force for all Republicans, for, the Repub for all the Republican base that it did uh, uh, in 2016. And uh, to me, I think that the crucial thing is going to be how coherently Democrats articulate an alternative. And so far, it's not looking all that coherent. I mean, on one hand, from Congress, you do, you know, in general, on the big picture, you have much more unity and much more vocal uh, kind of support for the immigration issues than I think we did in the past. But, you know, Vice President Biden, after three debates, still has not articulated a response, a, a, a consideration of what the baggage of Obama's legacy is on deportations for his he still is stumbling about this. He, he clearly doesn't, he's confused about what the asylum system is. And look what happened to Julian Castro with this boomerang when he proposed to, which was a very basic, you know, uh, he, rep he proposed to repeal the uh, statute that criminalizes first time uh, border reentry. And he seemed to, to, to win that debate, but the Republicans came in and said, no, you know, they, this is, just shows you that the Democrats are for open borders, and instead of kind of closing ranks and explaining why this is not an open borders proposal, there was, you know, the Democrats all seem to sort of run in different directions on this. So, so you know, I, that's my view, you know, how... <laughs>
if, if the Democrats don't come up with a forceful and coherent response, they need to decide, are we going to go for the, for the constituency that we lost in Wisconsin in, in 16, or are we going to build a new constituency? Are we, you know, or maybe we don't have to make that choice, but look at Florida, look at Nevada, look at Arizona. You know, I mean, yeah. what's going to happen? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, we're oversimplifying everything, and I get it because we're on a panel and we've got to, like, get get to it. But I I mean, to the role or the, the things that will impact the outcome of the election, like, we can't have a conversation without talking about the media, right? I mean, if you look and if you study 2016, the media, I mean, like, Trump didn't even really have to do that much, earn, like, didn't have to buy that much media. His ability to manipulate the news and to drive and take hold of the media cycle is unmatched on the other side, right? So he's able to deliver his message and to be relevant and to be in people's mind in a way that Democrats cannot. So you've got that. Then you've got another challenge with democratic consolidation, right? You can't consolidate voters if you still have a primary that goes until June of next year, right? Maybe you have a brokered convention. And so well, there, that's going to, you know, I think it's good to have a strong democratic process and primary and a robust conversation about policy and the politics, but it's another factor that we have to contend with because while, we, while they're all doing that on the democratic side, there's only one candidate who's really relevant on the Republican side. I think that what's happening on the, in the internet, the things that we don't know about, the way in which information is being distributed today, the way and the rise of misinformation today is another dynamic that's going to play. So it's not actually just about being able to articulate you know, immigration policy, though I believe it's critical that Democrats, that advocates, that everyone have a conversation about new policy frameworks, narrative shift, et cetera. It's, there are all of these other factors that are going to play out in the next year and will determine who is the next occupant of the White House. You know, and I think that there's this question about Wisconsin voters. I also think that there are a lot of people to, working to expand the electorate, right? And so, and I don't, and I don't think that we're talking enough about, and maybe this will happen later, about other trends, global trends, that have an impact on the way that we understand immigration. And frankly, not enough candidates are talking about that. Climate change and climate displacement. The future of work, <laughs> right? Like Republicans almost get to have to talk about immigration, have to make it about a culture war, really. Right. Well, they have this, is, this, is, this, is, this is ultimately <laughs> the discussion that we won't know until we actually, you know, yeah. until it actually plays itself out. But, you know, you've had a terrific uh, 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 run at the, what the elements are and all, uh, all of the things that could come into play. So I'd like to ask some more questions, but I know that there must be questions in the audience. So I'm going to go to the audience now, and uh, if for some reason they don't have questions, we'll continue among ourselves. <laughs> Uh, there are microphones here and here. Come up to the microphones and uh, please feel free to ask your questions. Sir? Okay, I'm Rashad. Yes, Tucker. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm, excuse me. Thank you. Please introduce yourself and tell us your affiliation. I'm Rashad Thomas. I'm the policy advisor for migration issues for the Episcopal Church's Washington office. Um, part of the calculus <coughs> for reforming immigration in the last 20 years has been um, essentially to ramp up border enforcement and immigration enforcement, um, essentially to give social license to um, immigration restrictionists to deal with the rest of the immigration system to legalize the undocumented population and reform legal immigration and all that sort of thing. Um, yet even with President Obama's very strong actions um, on the border and on enforcement, his record of deportations and whatnot, um, we've never been able to get Republicans to bite on um, a comprehensive reform. So my question um, and my confusion about this issue um, is just what what is the, how much border enforcement and immigration enforcement will be enough for conservatives and Republicans? I mean, we already spend more on um, border enforcement and immigration enforcement than any other federal law enforcement priority. So what is, what is enough? When will we get to the level of enforcement that will be enough for conservatives? Thank you. 
I assume that question's for me. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, I wanna make one point about comprehensive because I actually think this has been a fascinating dynamic over the past couple years. So in 2013, the Senate passes this big comprehensive bill and on the tails of Obamacare and you have to pass it to find out what's in it and all of that, Republicans were terrified of like this big massive immigration bill, right? And that's why we had this back and forth about comprehensive or what we then wanted to call piecemeal. So the way that we had teed it up before Eric Cantor lost and it all went off the rails was this multiple votes basically all in a week. So it wasn't all in one big bill, um, but it allows you to address all the issues in the same period of time because you can't separate a lot of these issues, right? Like you can't do e-verify without doing an ag guest worker reform package, like simply cannot do it. So it's interesting because even as we got into like border DACA last year, it's like it's always linked these two things together. So I think it's fascinating because Democrats have been moving bills in a piecemeal way this year. Um, not to say that they don't want comprehensive, but I think it's, um, I think, and I was on a panel last week with Democrat colleagues that agreed that comprehensive instead of giving everyone something to vote for, it's usually given everybody something to vote against and it's, it's collapsed under its own weight. So I think it's fascinating watching the Democrats move these piecemeal bills because, you know, as we start to, you know, and they're looking at like an ag bill coming up that will have a component of E-Verify in it. And I think, yes, we need to do it all and we need to figure out how to get it all done, but kind of putting a pro-immigration reform piece with a more enforcement piece, whether that's actually border security or it's, you know, something like E-Verify, like you do Ag Guest Worker and then you implement E-Verify for that sector because you've you've hopefully fixed the legal immigration problem. So it's, and it's hard to say, you know, what's enough, what's not enough. I personally think that the wall for most people is symbolic of just border security because if, I think if you go to the average person on the street and be like, what do you think about integrated fixed towers? Do you think we need more of those? Do you think we need more drones? Like they just don't know. Like I said, I'm from Wisconsin till I went down to the border. I don't know, like I didn't, I didn't, you can't fully understand it. So I, I think it's a sliding scale. I think on this, on the interior enforcement piece, it's just tough. We have to be good and welcoming to immigrants. We should be, that's what America has been about. We should accept refugees. We should fix the asylum system so that everybody is able to get their fair process and go through this. We should also, by the way, be investing in the Northern Triangle to try to fix those issues, to try to address that flow, right? Like, let's get to the root of the problem. So, uh, you know, what is enough? It's always, who knows? But I think being able to pull these pieces apart and pair things together, um, like the per country caps bill that everyone keeps talking about lately. When we were trying to do this last year after we'd moved a couple like really small bills to try to show the world that it wouldn't, everyone wouldn't die if we started moving immigration bills. Start small, really or really, really bipartisan. We were talking about doing the per country caps bill with some H-1B anti-abuse stuff, right? Which is broadly bipartisan. We gotta figure out exactly what that package looks like, but you put kind of a pro-reform piece with a little bit of a anti-abuse enforcement, let's put a check on this piece. And you put them together and see if you can't move forward. So. It's a hard question to answer, but I think that the, the dynamic over the past couple of years, how much it's changed from comprehensive and frankly how everyone's thinking about it, could really help us figure out how you, what, what is the appropriate level and what are we doing to put these pieces together? Go over to this side. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, my name is Austin. I'm a student at Georgetown Law. Um, so uh, I think you all spoke a little bit about this earlier, um, but Folks in DHS um, and some in the Republican Party have blamed um, overcrowded conditions in detention centers on a lack of funding. Um, so are there still discussions in the Republican Party, in DHS, even in the Democratic Party, about pursuing alternatives to detention that have succeeded in the past, such as the family case management program, or are those discussions just not being had anymore? Yeah, you're talking like ankle bracelets and things like that. Yeah, and programs that encourage court attendance if that seems to be an issue that um, people see in releasing um, families. Yeah, I think, you know, catch and release is something that has been talked about heavily. I think there are ways, alternatives to detention that have been trusted, that have worked in the past. Um, you know, I think we need to speed up the process in the first place. Like, let's talk about immigration judge and other things to make sure. And it's not just about ending the case quickly so you can find out if you get to stay or get to deport it, but like it's certainty for 
those migrants that are coming in as well. Like we need to fix the system holistically. And that's what I think is frustrating when it's like, well, should we hold them or should we not? Like, okay, yeah, we maybe we need to figure out how to, A, A if we're going to do it, we need it to be humane and we need to have the basic things water, toothbrushes, things like that, right? Like, bottom line. But I think we need to talk about it more holistically. I think Republicans are definitely open to alternatives to detention. We've talked about it a lot. Um, it's a weird, you have a, a very weird dynamic again in the Republican Party right now that we are still navigating. Um, but we should, we should look at it holistically and try to address the overall problems, get to the root of the problems, instead of just focusing on building up capacity for detention space. But you know, in the meantime, I think at least having the resources to be able to address a surge like we had um, is, is a very important thing. Julia, did you want to jump in here? Did you want to jump in here? Uh, no, that's, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I, I mean, thought I was getting I thought I was getting a signal. Uh, all right, I'm on this side. Hi, I'm Katie Benton Cohen. I'm professor of history at Georgetown University, the other campus, and I teach immigration history. Um, I want to do a comment and a question, which is what historians specialize in. First, I really want to um, thank Julia for the historical perspective, and I want to push us a little further with a comment that I have for Casey. Um, two comments. One, um, just briefly, I'm, I'm disappointed that you didn't um, take this opportunity to separate, perhaps, um, parts of your party from President Trump. I feel like you had the opportunity and maybe some daylight to do so, and I'm I appreciate your point about sort of warring factions within the party, but I, I feel like it was a lost opportunity. The second thing that I want to say is the history lesson part of this. I really, I lived for eight years in Wisconsin. I have two degrees from the University of Wisconsin. I'm also Me from too. Arizona. <laughs> Me too. Um, and I don't want to hear any more discussions of the difference between the two. In 1848, Wisconsin was the Arizona of the 19th century. As late as 2000, two thirds of Wisconsin has German heritage. There is a Dane County named for people that are Danish, Belgian cherries, the German triangle of Milwaukee, Cincinnati, and St. Louis. If you don't think race has to do with why you see Wisconsin as somehow a different story than the border, then we have done something fundamentally wrong in how we teach American kids about the history of immigration. The only difference between the Germans who came here, <laughs> the only difference between the Germans who came here after 1848 and the democratic revolutions of Europe and those who are seeking asylum at the border today is that we didn't have federal laws limiting them then. I'm not calling for open borders. I'm calling for a perspective that we take into reality what Julia said, that we are at a different moment. This is the first president who has denied in American history this fundamental part of our history. And I don't want to see any more suggestions that Wisconsin is fundamentally, historically different than Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, or California. OK, that's my, that's my <laughs> end. <laughs> I got to say a thing. There we go. I agree with you. So, I'm d I, yeah. you know, it's funny. I, I, I think you maybe misunderstood my point. My point was in terms of like the, the southern border infrastructure, in terms of kind Correct. of what's occurring down there. For me, being from Wisconsin, I'd never. Seen so, the for, this is, I'm talking like literally about infrastructure on the southern okay. border. I um, so, that. I think you misunderstood me. The other thing is, I actually have framed in my office a, because um, I'm Irish. My, my ancestors came from Ireland, and I have framed in my office a sign that talked about two immigrants coming from Ireland, and it's something that I talk about frequently, so I apologize if I wasn't okay, clear I'm on that, but I certainly agree with actually. you. I, 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 okay, so here's my question. Sorry, I, I did miss our speech. Um, you know, professors, we profess. I feel like we would be remiss with this fantastic panel not to ask Doris Meissner to reflect on what the last 25 years of Operation <laughs> Gatekeeper and Safeguard have contributed to this discussion in both positive and negative ways. Is this a break or is it a kind of logical culmination of a kind of emphasis on the demonization of, of 
undocumented border crossing as a phenomenon. That's not a critique on what your larger view about immigration is, which I think is different. It is a question directly about, do you see the politics of 2019 in some ways as an unintended consequence of those border policies? Thank you. Okay, as, so, as long as there are not other people at the, at the mics, I will give a quick response to that. <laughs> but this is a panel for these panelists. <laughs> and so I am going to go to a final question for all of us to answer. Um, I, I've written about this a great deal in the last year or so in terms of my view of what's going on at the southwest border at this point. And my view of what's going on at the southwest border at this point does not have to do with the border enforcement itself. It has to do with a fundamental difference in the flows, a shift in the flows that we could have seen coming for the last five, six, seven years, and the inability of the government, the Border Patrol, the agencies that are responsible for administering the border to really uh, uh, assess how profoundly different this flow is and what very different responses are required. So it is Border security is fundamental. We have to have border security as a country, but there are all kinds of ways of bringing it about. And had we invested in our asylum system over the years and in our judicial system uh, uh, going back uh, at least five years, it would be a different picture. And if we, were we to now have the kind of reception facilities and interagency coordination and immigration laws that make it possible to respond to a flow like we have from Central America, those are all things that need to be done, should be done, and there should have been stronger leadership to take us there, in my opinion. Um, let's, um, let's ask the question. Are you wanting to ask a question? Yes, I see. Okay, then there is one more question, please. Uh, my name is John Atchley. Um, I served in the Foreign Service for 28 years. I was stationed in uh, Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador during the war, and Venezuela, among other places. Um, two things I, I wanted to know if you might be able to talk about. One is the new public charge uh, rules that are coming in to effect on the 18th and how they're going to affect immigration. And the other thing, um, going away from the asylum problems, which are very, very real, to a broken immigration system where I think the Washington Post had an article not long ago about Maine, where they're finding that they don't have enough young people to not just do field work or man fishing boats, but when they have an aging population that the World Bank has now said is a super-aged population, where the population over 85 is going to grow in the next 10 years by 200%. Uh, over 65 by 100 percent and under 65 by only 12 percent, they have money to pay for home care for aging parents, but they don't have any people. So they have to tell people, sorry, we can only send somebody once a week. Um, they desperately need immigrants because that would be perfect jobs for immigrants. That article said that in the next 10 years, there are going to be another 12 states that will join the super-aged criterion, and in another 10 years after that, another 15. So half the United States is going to be super aged. We really do need to fix the immigration, the legal immigration system, to get people in. Um, so besides the public charge and the legal, I'd also like to just give a vote of thanks to Lomi for a story that she did back in August 2018, a very personal thing, where I'm married to a Mexican, and her, she became a, national, a naturalized citizen. Um, her minor daughter came with her. That was no problem. We got immigration visas for them. But um, if you are an adult relative from Mexico, it's impossible to migrate. I mean, you might as well go across the, the, the river because the waiting list to get somebody in is 24 years minimum. I would long be dead, and so would my wife, <coughs> before her daughter could come in. The thing is that her daughter has a U.S.-born infant son. And we always obeyed the law and said, well, look, you can't immigrate. There's no way. So we'll just do exchange visits. My wife will go down for three or four months. You guys will come up and live with us for two or three months. Never overstay your visa. Now, her daughter was on her second 10-year non-immigrant B1, B2 visa. And my wife had been down there together with the younger daughter. When they came back to Houston, 
they were detained by Customs and Border Patrol, not allowed to talk to the mother, interrogated for eight hours, and then Customs and Border Patrol invalidated her B-1, B-2 visa and said, we don't care about your 20-year record of legal comings and goings. As far as we're concerned, your mother's a citizen now, and you've got a U.S.-born child, therefore you must want to immigrate. Therefore, we're revoking your visa, and therefore you're standing in front of us here in Houston as an illegal immigrant, and we're deporting you tomorrow. And you may not apply for re-entry to the United States for at least five years. And there's no, I, I was in the Foreign Service, there's no junior uh, visa officer who's going to issue uh, a B-1, B-2 to somebody again if they check the record and say, oh, well, you know, your visa was revoked and you were sent out. So basically, my U.S. citizen grandson will not be able to come to the U.S. until he's of age to travel by himself. That's just one individual personal story of the broken legal immigration system. It's not that important, but I would like to hear what they have to say about public charge and the need for people to fill jobs in the United States. Right. Well, un you know, unfortunately, there are far too many stories like that, and it goes to, I think, what is surely a point of consensus on this panel that has come across all the way through, and that is that we desperately need to have a viable functioning immigration system that is reflective of today's realities in the economy and our demography in the labor force. Uh, and we're stuck in our inability politically to get there, not because there aren't some pretty good policy answers probably out there. It's the politics that have, has um, um, uh, hurt us and that we, I would argue, only are going to be able to solve by elections that create a different outcome. On public charge, we have a panel later this morning, later in the day on public charge. So unless somebody feels moved to say something about it here, um, we have some real expertise on public charge that we'll be getting to. Um, I'd like to close this panel, even though we're right on the minute right now, again on this political point about what it really will take to get immigration legislation because, as several people have said, the courts are very active, the executive branch is super active, it's the Congress that needs to weigh in in order to bring some stability back into this system, and how can that happen unless we have a different makeup in the Congress. Could I do a quick one answer down the line? What would be the best outcome from the 2020 election in the White House, in the House, and in the Senate? <laughs> Just, just the party makeup. What should be the best? What leadership of those three key bodies is the best combination to perhaps break through for immigration legislation after 2020? Julia. Oh boy, I'm a journalist. Party, I don't do party, the party, best party, party. Outcomes. What's the best combination? It's the uh, combination that matters. Doris, I'm very reluctant to answer that question, but I will say that I can't. See, uh, two things. One is. Uh, I can't see comedy on Capitol Hill being reestablished. It's, it's just difficult for me to imagine how that would happen if President Trump is reelected on this okay. issue. All right, you uh, can and I also want to just say quickly that the wild card here that we haven't talked about is DACA. Because if, depending on what the Supreme yeah. Court does, this may be... Exactly. And, and DACA well, is one on one of our subsequent panels. Require a legislative response next year, so right. we may find out more about... And TPS. Right. We'll get to DACA later today. Lomi? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Julia. If, even if uh, sent changes on the Senate, but change, not from the top, and the President won't sign the bill, I'm not sure. How Lorella? Um, I think we need changes in the White House, and... We need a different Senate. I, I, to be clear, also think it is important that we, that we find Republicans or that there exist Republicans that want to work on this issue. Um, so it's, it's, I think that the leadership of Congress and the White House need to look different in order for us to get to a place where this issue will be prioritized. And that alone won't be enough because Democrats on their own, without the pressure, and given all of the other issues that are part of the agenda going into 2020, into November of next year, um, they're gonna need a lot of pressure to actually prioritize this issue as well. That's a good point. I think that this does not get done under unified government. It didn't get done in 2008 when, when Democrats ran the world, and it didn't get done when we ran the world in 2017. So I think you need bipartisanship. At the end of the day, this has to be bipartisan. 
Okay, wait and see. Half an hour break, see you at 11.30.